Uh, today we'll be talking about two more products from Simplified Logic called Nitro Cell and Nitro Program. Uh, first, just want to tell you quickly about Elite Aerospace Group. So just a little bit about us. So we are a manufacturer in the aerospace sector, and we have an engineering services group, and that's the part of the company that uh, I work for. And we are a partner with companies like PTC and Simplified Logic. We help with a lot of the engineering needs of our customers. So we can help with things like engineering, drafting, and design work, and consulting, KLM architecture, CAD automation course, helping you with the software for all of those. So as a PTC partner, we help with MathCAD, ThingWorks, WindChill, Creo, and Vuforia. Here's a quick sampling of some of the services that we can do for you. Uh, and today we'll be focusing on our partnership with Simplified Logic. So I'd like to very quickly introduce, today we've got uh, as our guest, David Bigelow. He works for Simplified Logic are the experts in product and data management. They have several tools for automation in Creo. Uh, we've spoken previously about Nitro Bomb, which I highly recommend. If you have any questions about, we'd be happy to help with those. Uh, and today we'll be talking about Nitro Cell and Nitro Program, two additional programs that they have that work with Creo to help you get more out of the great tools that you already have. So uh, that being said, I'll pass the presentation over to David. All right, thank you very much. Okay, I'm sure that we have um, uh, the screens viewing here. So, uh, is the main slide showing right now? Okay, yeah, good. looks good and we can hear you fine. Awesome. So I'm gonna break this into kind of a part presentation, part demonstration. Um, the reason being is that some of the things within Creo are really hard to kind of understand unless you can kind of step away from it and kind of see what the big picture is. I put together a bunch of slides to kind of um, create the different that sometimes are faced by people who are trying to automate uh, their product designs and documentation with Creo. Hopefully you'll find a good tips in here and also some uh, some good thoughts. And uh, also just in the bigger picture, just kind of like the flow of, of information and how important it is um, within engineering, how information can come into the process from internal sources like configurators or ERP and then kind of progress through the rest of the system. Let's kind of break down like what are the various automation techniques that people typically use. Um, this is basically kind of what we've seen over the years. Uh, we've been using engineer back in the day since the Rev 7. So we've seen a lot of um, kind of the evolution of APIs and tools and capabilities and also uh, techniques for how to get things done. And this is basically kind of what the break is like. Acquired skills um, versus the cost and time estimates. You know, the basic automations most people think as well, map keys, relations, trail files, things of that nature. Um, more adventurous start to dig into Pro Program, and the really adventurous start to get into Pro Toolkit and Visual Basic and things of that nature. Um, the third party tools that are out there, including ours, typically are designed to kind of bridge that gap between reducing the required and also reducing the cost and the over managing automation uh, with Creo. Uh, and also, you know, to keep um, there is a, a bit of a, a separation between what a user does and what a programmer who's trying to program the system does. The knowledge between the systems and what they do is typically not um, well understood by programmers. Our users kind of see things and opportunities for, um, they kind of get things for free with, with uh, Creo when things regenerate. So there's a gap there. And uh, sometimes that's where the third party tools come in and kind of bridge, bridge, that, uh, bridge that gap and make it easier. Um, when I was thinking about this, I was really trying to think of like, what are the common pains that we see? And one of the biggest ones that uh, the higher complexity people try to do by putting so much information into Creo at a deep level, um, you know, they bury their bury related and so on and so forth, it typically results in a very kind of um, hidden process. It's not very visible or obvious unless it's well documented and understood by everybody that's working with it. And that translates into a high price, meaning there's there's always a trade-off. I mean, you can you can put it into Creo and do some pretty amazing things, uh, get nice structures, and it, as long as everything's kind of together and kind of locked together in that structure, it works well. But you want to start getting into item and, 
and um, you know more flexible uh, designs and approaches that things kind of get a little bit more difficult. So this is just a portion of what you can do with Creo, but this is kind of the most common things that we see. See um, a lot of layout notebook discussion, uh, not so much, but it. it uh, and then within assemblies, typically in the top-down um, realm, we're talking more along the lines of uh, skeletons, components, which could be assemblies or parts. And those could be family tables, or they could be related to each other in some way with copy geoms. And then uh, program time centers that equation. And then the flexibility of uh, changing the design sometimes uses things like interchange assemblies, which uh, are tag-based references for what should go, you know, in a particular stack up of geometry, which what could be replaced is either a subassembly or an alternative part or an alternative orientation, um, which which happens quite often also. Everything kind of still points to generating a drawing at some point, at some point, uh, or uh, model definition, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But we still see this as a very, very kind of common uh, deliverable. Um, our base definition has definitely been the radar of a lot of companies for the last probably five to six years, uh, in our in our opinion. Um, it is very powerful, but it is a cultural change, um, just internally, but also down to the supply base. So we still see a lot of the drawing um, kind of perspective really <laughs> being kind of the status quo. But model-based definition stuff is helpful for the drawings. We'll talk about that later. Um, our biggest recommendation for automating stuff really comes down to this. We recommend that notebooks are kind of avoided. And, and we say that for a couple of reasons. Um, there's a dependency relationship that's typically required to make those happen um, between the parts of the models. And uh, on the next slide, I'll, I'll give you a kind of a breakdown of each of these. Um, relations between assemblies um, so or between components and assemblies, you know, hard-coded relations, uh, referencing component IDs or feature IDs, is also something that we discourage. Um, copy job, they are necessary from time to time. It just depends on what your application is and, and how you're approaching uh, your overall um, auto, uh, design process. And then change assemblies, uh, they're useful. They've, they're very, very handy, um, but they do have kind of their own um, to go with them too. These are kind of the barriers that we typically see when it comes to automating um, uh, product designs and documentation within within uh, within Creo Parametric. Assembly relations within the assembly structure typically kind of locks down the reuse of a component. If a component has a relation within it that is expecting data from another part in this uh, to be along to it, or it's being um, uh, or it has inputs or something that's requiring the execution of something higher passed to it. It, that that often kind of creates a little bit of a burden in reusing those components and other designs because there's an expectation of information from something that that new design. Uh, copy geometry, there's just a little bit of deep baggage there, which has to be managed and understood, which is, you know, that's kind of a common thing. Everybody gets that. Um, notebooks are a little bit more special uh, because they're kind of in the realm of whoever saves last wins. If you had... Um, a particular product design that you uh, wanted in some cases for one product configuration or one product design so as to have one notebook same product in another product design was driven by another notebook it really depends the state of that model um, whether it be a part or assembly really depends on what when it was last saved and which notebook it was talking to so pulling up a new design or an old design that had an old notebook with it would need to uh, would would by default kind of pull of a more current notebook until the declarations were adjusted for it to properly uh, regenerate. So um, one of the, the, if it's a notebook that kind of like totally a one-off thing, but when you're starting to really um, say, well, in one you've got uh, a lot that needs to drive one design configuration for and another design for another configuration, it really gets um, it really gets complicated. So we that's that's why we don't recommend uh, notebooks because they do kind of great baggage. And then interchange assemblies, um, very good. They're very they're very powerful. It's a very, very, very cool capability within Creo, but it's also a very manual process um, for the most part. So um, customer a couple weeks ago that was asking, you know, about how do we how do we do this uh, this uh, reconfiguration of a design? I've got a thousand parts I need to, you know, be able to enter to slide into a stack up of componentry in an assembly. 
And the answer to that was, well, you have to have stable references to begin with, and or you can use an interchange assembly. And um, the change assembly would work in a heartbeat. It's going through a thousand models and, and mapping everything for the, the references. That's kind of the full part. So this really kind of speaks to the importance of focusing early on in your product, in just as an overall product planning, um, how you design things, your standard standards, making sure those standards are functional as possible because if you, if you, um, if you, especially more configurable designs, having, uh, standardized interfaces and references and naming conventions uh, pays off and in spades over time. One of the things that, uh, to try to kind of bring us into a little bit more focus about what automation is relative to Creo, I just want to kind of back off a little bit and say, okay, well, how, do, how, do, how are typically products sold? And this this uh, next few slides kind of breaks that down. Um, typically, we see that a product is often you know changes in size and also configuration options. So things are either stretching like rubber bands to kind of fill the gaps, or selected parts are being um, uh, slipped in on specific increments, or entire assemblies or subassemblies are are kind of being uh, placed in uh, based on the configuration requirements of something. The products are typically designed by groups. We have areas of specialties within a company that focus on specific things. And each of them have logic in their own relationship for how that kind of goes together. The most basic parametric approach that uh, people have used for years is to really focus on um, two components. Uh, basically, standard parts, which are autonomous. Autonomy is a very good thing. Um, uh, that it's, it's kind of a one-off uh, component drawing having a autonomous stuff is that you can pass it around to other departments other divisions other uh, even to a customer or to manufacturing uh, organizations you don't necessarily have to pass any other data or knowledge along with that for it to be able to be brought up and work family parts you know family tables family uh, parts and assemblies has, has also been kind of a go-to for a lot of people for design flexibility but they do contain a little bit of relationship baggage that kind of goes with them. Uh, a good example would be if a, a fastener library with like 3,000, you know, fasteners in it, um, you know, passing uh, a, a Creo model to somebody else would kind of require that that model go along with it also with all that data. In some cases, if it's an internal thing, that's not a big deal. But if it's going to a customer or to a vendor, um, maybe the amount of data that's being passed by default along with that is a good idea. Which is uh, typically why you know you see people, people use um, uh, step files and IGES files to kind of transfer things away from it to kind of get the knowledge a little bit more uh, protected internally. The other issue with that comes down to the PDM. Uh, PDM systems are created equal. Obviously, PTCs, um, uh, Windshield is going to do the best at this kind of stuff and managing it. Um, when you start getting into more advanced parametric approaches, this is kind of um, this introduces another layer of complexity. Uh, we we're talking about you know smart parts and layouts and things like that, where you actually have a part that has enough intelligence in it or an assembly to uh, react and respond to variable inputs in some way, typically by parameters. Um, when you start integrating smart parts that have deep in them, uh, along with family parts and you know family tables, and as well as standard parts, it can get pretty complicated pretty quickly. Um, uh, and the biggest risk is is not that it, it doesn't work really well. The risk is that um, depending on how the parts are, the smart parts uh, are being kind of, we call them master models typically, but depending on how those parts are being designed and how they're configured, it can actually uh, create um, a, a, a change risk, meaning it regenerates the model and enters data incorrectly by accident, um, or um, somebody just entered the wrong value on a parameter, uh, or something gets changed in a relation that wasn't expected, and the part design changes after it was released and is like moving towards uh, movie manufacturing or analysis or other areas. So it is, um, it is a, it's something that should always be kind of uh, considered. And, um, they, they're very positive things uh, you can do them, but uh, there is a small risk associated with having too much uh, knowledge in a part that is too easy to change. So the other big issue with this is, is not just the smart models, but also having a drawing that kind of reacts and responds to changes as they occur too. 
Um, there are limitations as to what you can do with Creo uh, relative to how much you can uh, Material balloons seem to be the one kind of sticking point. Um, there's always going to be a little bit of when it comes down to uh, automation on drawing. Fundamentally, if you're getting 95% there, that last uh, that last five percent is typically moving things around, positioning, you know, so on and so forth. Um, but all of this together, <laughs> when you start to um, uh, uh, worry about it, uh, put this in a PDM, for example, system, everything kind of has to kind of stay together uh, for it to work. So you have basically this huge, massive structure of of smart parts, family tables, and individual components are uh, configured must be available uh, and also the drawings must be able to react and respond and everything so each of these packages that you see on here that are released in pdm are basically just huge copies of the same thing over and over with different inputs kind of configuring what's there or different selections that a user has made to kind of replace things manually so um, it can get a little bit overwhelming when you do that and the real issue is that the structure um, that typically is driving all this stuff comes in two ways. Either you're entering data through a book and then kind of passing those through the declarations to the assemblies that are connected to it, or dropping things into the top level assembly or at least some component uh, and then passing things down assembly structures through the relations or through execute statement uh, in the pro program, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, so these com this combination of relationships and these different options for changing data kind of remains buried within the model. I mean, when you put it on the screen, you don't really see this stuff. You kind of have to know that it's there to discover it, um, especially if it's something you haven't touched before. It, it, it can be a little confusing when things uh, don't seem to be changing in ways you think they should. To kind of address this or kind of uh, the, the, the uh, benefits that are obtained in um, typically, you know, for especially a configurable product or an automation of any kind or typically managed within Windchill. That's the best place to put it. Windchill just kind of manages that complexity for you, which is a great thing. But the fundamental problem is still that we have a lot of locked information and relationships within those models and assemblies and so on and so forth that have to be kind of uh, kept together. Um, the workflow is typically, I mean, this is kind of an assumed business workflow. Engineering kind of does its thing. It it's supposed to produce. That knowledge is there. It reacts and responds the way it's supposed to. People who are in engineering know how to modify it. And then that gets checked in the windchill. And then whatever's in windchill will eventually get pushed as a result over to ERP or MRP. Um, let's talk about automation planning. Uh, by the way, Stuart, do we have any questions so far on what I've presented? Um, nothing yet. Okay, cool. So um, the biggest success factor that we see relative to automated Creo comes down to really one thing, and that's managing the flow of data. So the whole goal of automating something in Creo um, is to translate inputs into results. It doesn't matter where those inputs are coming from. It could be coming from an MRP system. It could be coming from a sales order system, a CPQ system, or whatever. Uh, but the bottom line is, is that if information is going to be put into the system or requirements are, it needs to be able to translate into something that can be acted upon quickly and efficiently. And um, the whole point is to put as much free stuff as possible as you're going. So one of the things that we've really encouraged our customers to do is to not try to replicate, especially when they have developers and, and staff, try to re replicate whatever a user does relative to Creo. Um, for reasons for that. It's not about the clicking of mouse buttons, it's the uh, step-by-step the -step process they go to to generate a or produce a new assembly. It really comes down to um, what what is the what the flow of the data that needs to occur and then what is going to do for you for free. Um, and this is the thing developers don't really kind of have an understanding of unless they've used Creo for many years. Um, the metric relationships and the dependencies and the updates that are occurring in Creo really cool benefits um, and save the time kind of be planned for and it has to be um, kind of um, uh, structured for so that the data is actually going to produce the results you're, um, you're making. The best advice we have when it comes to automating is just to keep it simple. <laughs> um, keep things with obvious dependencies and interactions and um, 
we think Pro Program is a very, very powerful capability. It's been around for many, many years. Uh, it's not well known. Um, it's it may have been known, but you know, just by a few people here and there. But we really think it's a it's it's a it's an absolutely wonderful capability uh, for assembly uh, configuration work, the part configuration work, all the way down to the feature level. Um, it's very easy to use. It there is a little bit of a barrier to it right now, which we'll talk about in a minute. Which is one of the reasons we wrote a, a product called Nitro Program. Um, but the other really neat thing that has kind of happened with Creo in the last several releases is the um, is the real push towards model based definition. Now, most people kind of viewed model based definition as um, moving away from the print and more to like a 3D PDF where you're able to kind of publish some information with kind of stored views and orientations and have the annotations and dimensions kind of show up the way you want them to uh, in those views. And that's really cool. It's really neat stuff. Um, but one of the things kind of added also was the ability to use something called an annotation feature. Uh, an annotation feature is actually a little bit uh, more useful than just a, a, a simple annotation that you would typically see in Creo. Um, they're basically the same thing. One shows up in the feature tree as an actual feature that you can actually put some logic around. Um, now, the big question then becomes, well, what can I do? Why is that important? Well, um, annotation features, <laughs> you know, when it comes down to the drawing, one of the biggest things we try to avoid it, um, the old way of doing things is to model something, create a drawing, and then annotate it in some way. So you, you would see that kind of workflow on the left, where uh, the modeling would have been done, the drawing kind of set up, and then you go in and you show dimensions, or you create dimensions, which is not a good idea, typically, or or, you, um, or you're um, putting notes and things like that on a drawing freeform. That's a manual process, and it's very kind of expensive, uh, because it is a manual process. But if you actually kind of look at the at the right side here, um, the the annotation feature capability that's been added to Creo really enables the drawing more streamlined and simplified. It becomes more responsive and more um, more useful. Um, put logic on those things. So, for example, if we have a feature or a set of features or a pattern or whatever that's related to a particular um, parameter setting. Um, those features, uh, the features themselves, you know, whether it be cuts or protrusions or whatever, can turn on and off, but also the annotation features related to those. So if you have special notes that are attached to a boss, or if you have, um, you know, different dimension scheme that's required for a bolt pattern that's uh, driven differently by logic than it is, than it needs to be presented on a drawing for inspection purposes, the annotation features are kind of there to really just make things so much easier. So the annotation features allow you to kind of put more of that information into the model, which can still be used by model definition, you know, desired targets like PDFs and things like that. But they really help the automation so that the, the amount of time and energy you spend on the drawing and verifying that it's working correctly relative to any automation that you're doing relative or configuration of a part or an assembly just gets so much cleaner. So, um, and what I mean by that is that um, Sometimes you'll see situations where a uh, a drawing, uh, somebody would have created a drawing, and then you go and you say, well, okay, I'm going to put some logic around some features and change it to a different um, a different configuration. And then we get the uh, purple or magenta dimensions all over the place and notes. Well, those are lost references, uh, probably because they were created manually on the drawing. Um, this is one of those free things that PTC kind of gives you, and that is that if you turn something off on the drawing, excuse me, in the model, the drawing will also turn off um, any associated dimensions and notes that are to with it, provided you have it set up correctly. And then if you turn them back on, they magically reappear. And if you've got them positioned and controlled the snap lines and located correctly, they'll always show up in the right spot, even if the part you know, kind of changes uh, or flexes in size or whatever. You can really get some sophisticated uh, and free benefits with very little work. One of the things that um, we really kind of preach to our customers is the the way to do better parametric automation is to really kind of isolate uh, and better control of the the data that's coming into the system. That could have started with just the knowledge, meaning we took data that was in a design, or we know how we want to configure the design, and we put it in Excel. Um, Excel is a very transparent 
an open kind of environment. It's very easy to see what's going on and why. It's not so easy to do within Creo. Advantage of working in a, you have a lot more capabilities to look and integration. Connecting to other systems is a breeze. It's just it's just a kind of <laughs> middle ground your time um, because if you just hand if you bury all that information into Creo, there may be and capabilities that you want in Creo that you can't do in Creo because it's just limited. Doesn't have like for example table lookup functions and the typical V lookups and so on and so forth, or the lookup functions they do have are very, very limited to a specific number of um, parameters and value types and data types. Uh, whereas with Excel, it's kind of, it's, it's the wild, wild west. You can do pretty much anything you want to do. Um, and then it's just a question of how you get it to Creo. Um, the other big advantage of Excel is that connecting it to other systems or other data sources it's very, very easy. So if if you have nothing but a CSV file or a text file that is being exported from another system, uh, for example, we have one customer that um, exports all of their fastener data, all of their raw data, and all of their purchase data out of their P system, and that is used to uh, as references into it that can then be uh, referenced within the automation to drive uh, um, you know, to, to drive change within the designs and or that the descriptions and things that are coming from ERP are correct in the CAD system so that when it gets back around for a final bill of materials and releases, there's consistency across the board. So um, very, very capable, very, very capable tool. I mean, it's even better today than it was, you know, uh, six years ago. Um, and it's it just keeps getting better and better. So with that, let's first talk about one of the most lowest level things you can do, and it's with something called uh, uh, Program. It, it's basically a graphical editor for Pro Program. If you're familiar with Pro Program, uh, it's typically only used in parts and assemblies. Um, drawing programs are different. Um, they have kind of their own editor and their own kind of language, if you will. Very similar, but just not a, not in the same context as a, as a part or assembly. But the, the problem, the biggest problem with Pro Program is this. You really don't know it's there when you look at a model. Um, nothing to kind of indicate that the model is driven by one. That's actually controlling feature status, meaning um, uh, suppressed or, or active, uh, is, is buried within this text file, OK? And you get to this text file by going to the Tools tab, hitting Model Intent, and editing the program. And then this is kind of what you get. It comes up in the text editor. And as you can see, um, if we didn't have this highlighted on, it would just look like a blob of text. So you got to kind of look for the start and end of a feature definition and then slide your logic around it. And it, it's kind of a tedious process um, to set these up uh, using a text editor. We've been doing automation of Creo models and assemblies for a long time. So um, like anything else we've created, when you get frustrated enough with doing something uh, that takes a little while, you're going to go change it. So we actually built a tool called Program, which does this. So this actually takes the same um, uh, program that is in either a part or an assembly, compresses it down to its element, uh, its, its nodal elements of what those features is, and then allows us to kind of better visualize what the structure is around those things, uh, specifically for what logic drives what. Uh, so this is much easier to see, much easier to interact with. Um, uh, if you have any kind of nesting that occurs, like the logic with if statements or else statements, it's much, much clearer to see what's going on here and why uh, versus going uh, into a text editor and trying to keep all of that, you know, across hundreds of lines of, uh, of data uh, clear in your head. So um, let's go take a look at uh, Nitro Program first. Uh, let me see, how do I? this over switch this okay i think this is it okay can you see my screen i think you can hello okay uh yes we we see your screen okay so um i've got uh i've got a couple of examples here so I have two different speaker assemblies. One of them 
driven with Pro Program, and the other one's driven uh, with NitroCell. We'll talk about the NitroCell in a bit. I just want to kind of show you kind of like the typical approach uh, the Nitro Program has. So uh, the way you launch it is you just download the software uh, from our partner site and um, request a request, you know, register and request a demo uh, license. And then once you've got it kind of localized to your Creo environment, um, do is just kind of launch it. And um, this is what it'll do. So it's actually reached out into Creo, grabbed the pro program of this assembly, and it's brought over uh, screen. Now, the real beauty about this is immediately you can kind of tell by hovering what is a parent and a child of something. Um, this is where most people spend their time um, struggling. Uh, because the text editor doesn't tell you what a parent child it does, but it does, but it's not obvious uh, as to what it is. You really have to spend the time kind of either what's connected to what the model is created, or uh, or hunt through the various reference IDs to kind of figure out what's gonna what's gonna problem or why something doesn't um, doesn't work. So just hovering over each of these nodes in the tree here um, uh, shows me the indicates that that's a parent. Uh, red indicates a child. It's a child. So in this case, this grill, the cone is, is the uh, is the meaning. If the cone goes away, all of this stuff below that's in you know that's currently selected will fail. Um, and um, and we also have just a few other things. Now, this is this is a uh, a, a more classical um, pro program approach. Uh, so there's an input section which you don't see in the screen at all. You don't see any of the logic here either. Uh, we see this one here. So um, in this introduction, this is something that people can use to kind of collect input for what kind of input do you want to, what data do you want to pass to this design? So you can see here, you can ask very basic questions like to parameters. So we can say, okay, my cruise is going to be a yes or no question that goes below it. And then I've got some logic as to, you know, if I include the screws, do I want to ask them additional questions about what screws there, so on and so forth. Um, the effect of that is that when you read the model, and I kind of press Control V here, you get this kind of side dialogue up, which says you can either accept the current values for the regeneration of this, or you can come in and enter. If we come in and just say select thing and say done, it's going to ask us, you know, include screws. Sure. Okay. What screw length do you want? Well. If I put in 25, uh, I'll take the Phillips, I'll take the nubs, kind of reconfigured our design. Now, the way this is working is is two things. This is actually, the screws are actually a, a family tool. So in this particular case, um, we we have a couple of things. We're using kind of a lookup inst function, which is something that's been around in Creo for many, many years. And what it does is it allows you to kind of uh, take a value of something, um, um, to what's going on in the in the family table, and then try to identify which uh, or instance should be used, and that goes into a, uh, a variable, a string variable in this case, which will then be passed later on into the design as these variable references here uh, for what should be there based on the look that occurs. Now, the problem with lookup instance is that it's very limited. You can only do certain things, and then it expects numeric values for, for its matches, like Excel, which you can strings and text and, and all kinds of stuff like value. And it's very much it's pretty much unlimited as to what you can do. So um, this is a this is a very critical approach. You can see here we also had to kind of convert if somebody entered a square without you know we didn't want to necessarily uh, that somebody knew what a uh, a drive number was you know, as to what it can uh, correlate to Phillips or a square drive. Um, and that that all is kind of just passing through here to the relations. Now, some other things that are occurring here. Uh, for example, um, if we look at the parameters of this model, these are all the parameters that are currently active in the model. Um, we try to identify uh, what are the parameters that are influencing the model, meaning our relation, or are they actually uh, driving logic in the pro program in some way? This is just a, a nice way to kind of get away from too much information to really what's important quickly. And you can also um, uh, change from here in a moment. I'll, I'll talk about that in just a sec. Um, these execute part statements, these are pro-program specific calls. Basically what they do is they pass information from one level down to another. Uh, so I'll give you a quick example of that. I'm going to kind of hide some of these here. 
So the interface on this basket here, uh, there are two options. That can be uh, one of them is moves like this, and the other one is like this. so. If we regenerate the model and say uh, values or front plane interface, compress. You can see information has been collected at the very top of the assembly, which is what the inputs were for, and then it's passing those parameters down to these models for them to regenerate. So each of these models has to have input to receive that information and then continue on with their own pro program logic as to what should be shown. Uh, I'll give you what it looks like for a part. So if we pull up the front plate and we look at its pro program, we hear that there's an expected input from the pro program and then that is passing through to turn on specific features as to when they show up. Um, one of the really nice things about this tool is that you can actually come in and modify things and kind of test them as you're here. So if we come in and say particular parameter, I want this to be and pass that across, then you could see that we well to kind of get that variation. Um, the other nice thing about this, and as I was talking about earlier with, with the um, uh, annotation features, you'll notice here that um, in this assembly, excuse me, in this component here, we have an annotation feature uh, for um, uh, that shows up here. And it's so if we can actually come back um, over here to the, do it from from Creo, uh, just so it's easier to easier for it to be we'll come and like our part, and then we'll change this to compression. So we regenerate this. You'll notice that the annotation feature disappears in the proper dimension show up. So that's like one of the biggest, best things that we've seen out of PTC. Uh, we were actually kind of nervous about the model-based definition stuff because um, we always, I mean, our customers are always focused on the drawings. But when we discovered that this capability existed, it was just, uh, uh, it, we felt it is a tremendous improvement to the, the uh, to the workflow process of how things are, are being automated uh, within Creo. So, Pro program, like I said, it, it, or Nitro program is is a very very um, useful piece of software. I'm going to go to the to the speaker level here. And the other nice thing about this too is that adding logic is is a breeze. So if you want to add uh, logic in here, you can see kind of what its end is, and then just simply drag down, uh, simply drag down. If you want it to go. You can also add in additional logic if you want to, uh, and then adding it is really just as simple as. Uh, um, identifying a parameter that you want and placing it in there, or uh, you can add, of course, multiple statements if you choose to. Um, it also uh, is sensitive to the type of data that's there. So if it's a string, it automatically quotes it. If it's a Boolean, it leaves it the way that uh, the program expects it. Then when you send this back, we'll just uh, you know, uh, properly apply uh, and modify the design according to what your needs are. So um, again, very cool tool, very helpful tool. Um, and we think it, it comes down to um, relating things. It, it's it's really it's it's kind of the bee's knees when it comes to managing programs. Okay, let me switch back to my screen here. Okay. Okay. And so. if there's any questions, now might be a good time as well. I, I still don't see any in chat session, but just wanted to remind people that. We will handle any questions if there are any. Okay. The whole point, the whole point of Nitro program was basically to, um, it was a tool we developed because we were kind of frustrated with dealing with Exciter. And the more and more we used it, and the more and more customers saw it, they were like, hey, we need to. Uh, and that's kind of how most of our products have kind of developed. It's been our own frustration that we've created something that we needed to make our jobs more efficient and asking to uh, uh, also take advantage of it in some way. Um, talk about NitroCell for a second, because uh, I don't want to kind of run out. I want to leave a little bit of time for questions if we can. Um, the big difference between Nitro Program and NitroCell is, is Nitro Program is kind of like a little scalpel. You can kind of go in and things at a very low level within parts and assemblies. You can get some pretty amazing results pretty quickly. NitroCell is really kind of, it's like a Swiss Army knife. That um, It's one of the tools that it, it's so purpose it. Um, our customers continually surprise us with how they use this tool. Um, some of them for assemble a 
drive uh, top-down automations and automations. Standards validation and enforcement. Cost estimation is one that we didn't see people um, really kind of gravitate towards, but they, especially in the sheet metal areas. Um, reuse is another big one. You know, the kind of leverage Excel capabilities to identify which be used, which I'll show in a, a small example of here. Enterprise integration and many, many other things. The whole premise of it is is really just simplicity is power. Okay, so we're looking for when we created this tool, we were really focused on. I don't want to learn. I don't want my customers to learn API, a whole new way of doing things. Um, we wanted to really keep it a user kind of friendly process. Meaning a, a Creo user could adapt to it pretty quickly. Really more kind of a. a, a I want you to do this, now go do it, and it, and it's specific to things. For So for example, if I want to open a model, this is all you need to type. And that's really the majority of all of the commands within NitroCell are on this same basic template. I want something done to a specific thing, whether it be a model, a parameter, a note, or, or just at an application level or a worksheet, and want to uh, tell it what to do and go do it. And then you can kind of chain this stuff together and you can kind of relate it to each other using Excel and just do some really fascinating things. Um, the, the way it works, very, very simple. There's really no dependencies and no relationships between the Creo models or Excel. Okay, so there's no dependent relationship. There's no object link. There's nothing. It's, it's all on demand and it executes only when you press the button. So um, Excel is kind of off to the side, Creo is off to the other side, NitroCell sits in the middle and then basically kind of ties them together when you want them to and disconnects from both when you're done. Um, and um, way beyond just kind of like doing simple stuff, you can do some pretty amazing things, which I'll give you a, an example or two of. Our success model for our customers, going back to that original kind of graphic that we were looking at, is kind of like this. We want to collect user, we collect in Excel, use Excel and all of its power and capabilities to kind of derive what, what should go to Creo to, to, um, to either assemble, create, or, or you know, put this together, uh, modify things, change their status, whatever the case may be, and the drawings to go with those also. And process. And that release process, what it does is it strips all of, when you're ready to kind of release the it goes and it takes that master model and then strips it of all of the extra logic and all of that important stuff that um, kind of derives the design out of it and saves kind of a, a subset of it. So these models and drawings, when they're done, they look like PTC drawings. They're just not as responsive as the model were before. So they don't have as much information of them. The relations will be stripped out of them. They're basically, as they were derived, is kind of how they are. And you can go push those off for release and they can go their own life cycle be on that point. Um, Excel files and master models should always be kind of kept separate and under their own control within PDM, just like anything else. Uh, so it, it's it's just common sense to do that. Um, is that um, a weak tool on functionality? Uh, a lot of these functions that you see on here are very, very, very powerful. Uh, some of them look like one line to do one thing, and that's the way it is, and other things that look one line to do th something it does a lot. Um, uh, first article inspection reports would be a good example of that, which I'll show you here in a few. So let's talk about uh, NitroCell. Go back to our screen. So I'm going to exit out of Nitro program here. I'm going to erase uh, my memory. And let's go take a look at a couple of things. The first thing I want to show you is just kind of how to do something from scratch. So I have a uh, an empty Excel file here. So this is one thing that's actually kind of neat about this. You can actually take an existing Excel file and can work with uh, your automation however you want to. Um, but Microsoft Excel is, is basically just an application that kind of sits in between Excel and Creo. And, uh, all we need to do to kind of upgrade that file is to just select the file and then simply say upgrade the workbook um, so that we know what we're doing. And then it is going to um, pull this uh, worksheet up and then 
uh, upgrade it. This, all this did was just add a couple of worksheets. It adds in the, the feature matrix, uh, which is used by other, other worksheets to kind of uh, manipulate things, uh, and a nitrocell main. The sheet was already there, the sheet one. Um, with nitrocell, there's actually three types of data. So you've got uh, execute worksheet is basically just kind of what you would expect it to be. So if I said uh, open model, is going to be the, the the thing that I want this to do. Um, this allows you to kind of put your commands together. So you could say I want to do, let's say, um, open. There it is. I want. You could also just put in. Um, we could say open speaker ASM, and uh, just that quickly. Is it connect Creo for the first time? It has executed that command. Um, it, you can do this any number of ways you want to. It's it's a very very powerful capability. Uh, for example, if we wanted to uh, quickly batch through a bunch of things, we could say batch list. And in this particular case, we're going to say uh, say uh, actually let's do this. Let's make the order doesn't really matter here, uh, but I'm going to say yeah, let's do this. Let's make this um, let's create a new execute sheet called uh, run batch. Or let's say uh, batch item. And we'll do the same thing over here. We'll just say open. And we'll connect this back to our batch list. We happen to know that every model is going to be read from that particular cell. So if um, and our batch item is going to load here. So in this case, we're going to let's say do an application batch list files. Let's say I want to do all of my. Well, let's just do all the parts for now. We're going to pass that to our batch list, and we're going to run each batch item. Then the only thing we need to do is basically start batch. So we'll do batch start. Of course, I've got to spell this correctly. And when we run this, see that it's gone and grabbed everything off the local working space where uh, working tree. You can also get it out of workspace too. And all that did was just go grab whatever content was out there and then start to uh, loop through each of them. So it's very easy to kind of uh, do some pretty amazing things pretty quickly. I'll show you kind of a, a more sophisticated example here of something that uh, let's say we wanted to generate PDFs. So let me show, run this. And what this is doing, it's doing the same type of batch operation that we just did. Um, in this case, it's it's loading up each drawing. Uh, it's actually creating drawings uh, because we don't have any drawings for these created yet. And then going through and um, uh, exporting a PDF of them. So I know that the most perfect thing in the world because it's using a drawing template to generate drawings dynamically and generating a PDF, but I'm just trying to show you the functionality of what you can accomplish pretty quickly. Uh, let's see. And so as a breakdown of what this does, the first thing it did was erase memory. It uh, created a directory, a subdirectory, which if we look here, here's our PDF directory that it was created, and here are the uh, PDF files that uh, were generated by that process. So uh, again, something you would typically do uh, with things after they've already been kind of cleaned up and all that kind of stuff, but just for demonstration purposes. So we've collected um, all of the parts. We've started our batch. It gave us all the list of items in there. And then on the drawing, it, it loops through each item, gets the root name of it, uh, creates a drawing using a template. Uh, and you could, of course, change the template size based on the size of the model if you wanted to determines the final location, and then exports the PDF. So pretty straightforward. Um, last thing I want to show you is really kind of related to, uh, he, uh, Stuart mentioned this in the email, so I thought I'd, I, I thought I'd show it to you. Uh, and that's something called a, a, a FAIR export. Um, it is, it's a first article inspection report. So I've got uh, a bunch of other drawings here. These aren't speakers, this is a, a GPS tracking device. 
And in this particular case, um, what it's going to do is very similar to as we just did before, except it's focusing on the drawings. And in this case, it is drawing, looping through each sheet, each sheet, finding all of the mentions that are on each sheet, cataloging that data. And it's going to put uh, symbols related to the mention on each print or each sheet, and then export a um, uh, cell file with all of that data compiled. Uh, we'll do that in batch mode, so we're we're actually batching separate um, uh, first article inspection reports for each drawing that you hear. Now, the common question we get on this is, what about the GD&T? The GD&T is um, uh, some. There's been some changes in the APIs uh, within PTC. Uh, we don't have that app yet. We're kind of for the right set of customers to come on board to kind of push this over to the to put that in place. So the customers we dealt with, this is more than efficient with it for what they're trying to accomplish. And I'll show you uh, when this gets done here in a second, uh, just kind of what these look like when they're um, when they're finally generated. We're almost finished here. Another thing about this is you can also um, rename the drawing in session and save it. You have a copy of the fair drawing uh, with the annotations on it versus um, the modifying the original drawing if you want to do. So if we go back to the other uh, look up uh, drawing, oops, let's look up drawing here. We go for the lower housing, and these are all the files that were exported. So this is the report that was generated in Excel, and it has every every dimension uh, labeled, where it's located, what view it's on, the type of dimension that it is. Uh, if we zoom up here, uh, we should be able to see. Um, in fact, uh, dimension B there should be 2.1 with a plus 5 minus 0. And this too, with this template, is that if you enter in a, a value, it will tell you whether it's within compliance or not. You can even kind of flag uh, you know, how it was done and put any other uh, remarks into it. So with that, I, we've only got about uh, six minutes left. I I'd open this up for just kind of any questions. Um, uh, Stuart, do you have any questions that have popped up? No, nothing came in yet. Okay. The um, would you would you like me to show anything else, or or do you think we're pretty much covered it? Ah, uh, well, let's open up to the session. Uh, does anyone have any questions? You can put them in the chat session or unmute yourself to ask away. Oh, I did want to show one more thing since we've got just a little bit of time. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's, let's take a look at this one. Um, this is actually kind of a, a uh, we, we talked about the, the speaker assembly earlier and how that kind of worked. Um, this particular one, this little automation I kind of put together this morning just as kind of a test. And that's not what I want. So the, uh, the 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 really slick part about this is that this this input sheet here, there's an input that just basically asks three basic questions. Okay, so we have a compression, you know, the face type for the inside of this uh, compression or knobs, the screw length, uh, the square. This is kind of showing me a preview of what the derive is. Now, the nice thing about this is that um, we actually kind of it created this Excel table. And out of the Excel table, we extracted a couple of more things that will automatically populate kind of like our pull downs here. So, uh, these pull downs that are here are actually kind of auto populated based on the screw data, which could have been imported from a database or it could have been a CSV file. So this is a really good example of I want to ask it for some textual input relative to something which doesn't need to be converted and you're not limited by kind of look up uh, inst approaches uh, within Creo. You can actually kind of use Excel uh, to kind of derive some of this stuff. So what this does is it, um, oh, does it erases memory, opens up the speaker assembly. Uh, in this case, it's setting the speaker uh, basket uh, interface to compression versus knobs like we did before. And instead of having double placements uh, for um, the design, I'll show you what this uh, pro program looked like for this model. Uh, 
So in this particular model, we don't have any of the, the other stuff that we had in the, in the more conventional approach. So you can see here, my inputs are empty, my relations are empty, and uh, these components, they're here now, but they aren't here in the original model. So if we close this out, erase memory, open up uh, the speaker, export this out, the default state of everything. So we have the same relationships, we just don't have um, a lot of the extra stuff that would normally be in pro program because we're actually doing so um, this in this particular case we're actually pushing these parameter values directly to those models without having to pass them in through and trickle them down through the assembly um, which is a very powerful capability when you think about it and then the screws are actually being assembled uh, using named references uh, to the grill which has the coordinate systems on them and then we're just trying to generate so uh, based on how we've got this uh, selected for if we come and we change your inputs to say, well, I, I really like a, a longer screw and maybe a square head on it, run it again, we're generating, a, we've been configuring a brand new design, everything's constrained, it'll pass model check. Our drawings would, of course, be updated. Um, we might make a subtle change for um, the placement of maybe a, draw, a, a build material balloon or something like that, but that can even be automated with an annotation feature uh, placement if we want to. Um, and now we have our, our, our new variant configuration which could be published and pushed out. Uh, if we wanted to, for example, remove something like, um, let's say I didn't want a particular item uh, in here, adding in, uh, let's say, um, let's say we didn't want uh, gasket.prt to be there at the end of this process, uh, and it was there by default, we could have a simple have it removed, and then here's our new variation of the design. So with that, I think we're right up against the mark here. Uh, did any questions pop in? Yeah, we actually had a couple. Um, okay, good. First one was, can you batch with other third-party tools such as CapVidia? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Uh, can you run batch with other third-party tools such as CapVidia? That's a good question. Um, I think that, uh, I mean, our batch process right now is really tied into focusing on passing information to Creo. Um, if you wanted to do something like that, you could actually, I believe it would be possible to maybe put a macro or something in place to kind of uh, tie into other other systems. Uh, it, it really, we'd have to look at it a little bit closer to make sure that the interface was as clean as you wanted it to be, but if it wasn't something that could be done like right now, um, it's something that we could probably add uh, without much trouble. So um, we'd just follow up on that if you And then uh, one other question was about the pricing. What's the price point of Nitro Program and Nitro Cell? Um, Nitro Program is $2,700 per year for a floating license. And it, uh, a floating license, uh, the licensing all is all done in the cloud, so it can be shared across uh, a person in the same department or all the way around the world, uh, but only one at a time. Nitro, Nitro Cell is $4,200 a year for a floating license, and it can be the same. And looks like those are all of the questions. Uh, and like you said, we're we're right up against the hour. So if there are any questions, we'll we'll happily take them. But otherwise, I think we'll probably try to wrap up. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody for your time today and uh, and sticking through and asking some good questions. And if you have any, any more, uh, definitely reach out to Stuart or or ourselves, and we'll be happy to help you. Yeah.